So skeletal muscle is a very dynamic tissue. It's very responsive in terms of its mass, uh, particularly to inactivity, aging, and also certain chronic diseases. We see a reduction in muscle mass. And on the flip side of that, functional overload and the presence of anabolic hormones can increase muscle mass. And I'm particularly interested in how certain anabolic agents and pharmaceutical anabolic agents can increase muscle mass and in particular how they work and the biology behind that. So today I'm going to present a bit about beta-adrenergic agonists. Uh, in particular we used uh, ractopamine. This is a mixed beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic agonist. And these are commonly uh, used by bodybuilders. Uh, they typically increase lean mass and reduce fat mass. They also come with this uh, these other phenotypes that they induce on the muscle, and that is a faster contracting muscle uh, fiber type. And typically you get this switch in metabolism as well, from a less oxidative to a more glycolytic phenotype. This is very well characterized, and yet it remains unexplained as to why that actually happens. And perhaps more importantly, does that metabolic change play a role in the therapeutic action of those drugs. Now, our experiment wasn't designed to answer that question, but I want to introduce it because some of the data we find suggests that the extent of this metabolic change might be more than what we have previously known. So this was our study design, and the ultimate aim here was to identify molecular events that are occurring in the skeletal muscle during the administration of anabolic agents. This work was conducted in pigs, and we had three treatment groups. There was a control group, uh, a group that received growth hormone, and a group that received this beta-adrenergic agonist, ractopamine. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just talk about the beta-adrenergic agonist and ignore the growth hormone for now. But this was a time course study design with five time points. These pigs were treated for up to one month. And at these, each time point, the pigs were slaughtered, and we took uh, tissue samples uh, from multiple tissues. Today, the data I'm presenting is from the LD muscle, uh, longissimus dorsi. And we took this muscle, um, we extracted RNA. We then used this RNA for microarray analysis from all pigs. So there was 165 pigs, so this was a big uh, transcriptomics data set. And then, because of the time course nature and the multiple treatments, there becomes a problem in how you analyze that amount of data. And we use something called a MARSIG Pro clustering method. This is an algorithm which tries to group clusters of genes that are displaying a similar temporal expression profile in response to treatment and time. And this was really interesting and we pulled out a lot of interesting data. And then we followed up some of this work with, uh, or some of these targets with RNA and protein validation. So these were the clusters that were uh, generated by the, in the beta, beta agonist treated pigs relative to the control. And the dotted line represents the beta agonist group and the solid line is the control. And like I said, this, this pulls out groups of genes, or in this case probes, microarray probes, that were displaying similar temporal expression profiles. And it really demonstrates how dynamic the muscle tissue is, and that you start giving this treatment on day naught, and throughout the month you can see there is a, a definite, certain times where the responses are peaking and where things are coming down. And most of our follow-up work uh, of the targets we were interested in were peaking around this day three time point. And I've circled two um, clusters, and one of those clusters contained multiple probes for this PSAT1. Um, we were interested in this, and this was by far the most reoccurring probe to come up in the analysis. And I've also circled there in cluster two, PHGDH and PCK2. And I'm gonna come on to what the context of these enzymes are but they are all involved in amino acid biosynthesis. So we were very interested in this. And here I've put into context where some of these enzymes are. So PHGDH uh, 
and PSAT1 are in this serine one carbon glycine biosynthesis pathway. And this stems from glycolysis. So you have glycolysis coming down here on the left, feeding into the TCA cycle. And this pathway stemming from glycolysis is this serine one carbon biosynthesis pathway. And PHGDH, PSAT, and we also validated PSBH, which is the final uh, enzyme in that pathway. And the figure on the bottom right corner is the mRNA validated by qPCR. And as you can see, the, the white bars are the controls, and I'm going to focus your attention on the gray bars, which is the beta agonist treated. And you see the same temporal expression profiles that the, was identified in the MARSIC Pro clustering, with this big increase in expression at day three. And uh, in, for some of those transcripts, they were remained upregulated for two, three, and sometimes four weeks following that time point. And then also this PEPCKM, which is encoded by the PCK2 transcript. And this followed the exact same uh, sort of expression profile at the transcript level. And PEPCKM is a, uh, typically involved in gluconeogenesis. There is a cytosolic form, and this is the mitochondrial form. Uh, the cytosolic form didn't change in here, but the mitochondrial form did. And this diverts carbons out of the TCA cycle and back up into gluconeogenesis, and this can also feed into this biosynthesis pathway. We then looked at the protein expression of PHGDH and PEPTKM. So PHGDH is the initiating enzyme of that pathway. And we saw here, this was at day seven, so this is following the major peak in mRNA expression of that enzyme. You see about a two-fold increase in expression of this, this enzyme. And the same holds true for PEPTKM. Again, about a two-fold increase. And the scatter plot here and where I've highlighted the gray circles. These gray circles, each one identifies uh, an individual animal, and the gray circles are the beta agonist treated uh, animals. And you see uh, a coordinated increase. The, the, both of these enzymes are upregulated in the beta agonist treated pigs. So what, what does this mean, and what, what are the implications? And I mentioned at the beginning that you give these beta agonists and you classically see a switch from an oxidative to a glycolytic metabolism. And this ha often happens in cancer metabolism. You get this switch to a more glycolytic metabolism. Um, but it, th this is interesting in that it's not in, a, in an effort to produce more ATP and more to redirect metabolic flux into the biosynthesis of anabolic intermediates for growth. And this is what we see here. In essence, we are seeing a, a switch, perhaps, in uh, pathways that are leading towards the biosynthesis of anabolic intermediates. And both PHGDH, in particular, and PEPTKM have recently been implicated in a number of very rapidly proliferating cancers. Uh, they are upregulated, and it is thought that they are upregulated to overcome any sort of nutrient deprivation, and they can permit very rapid growth under nutrient-deprived conditions. So this is quite interesting to see this in, in a largely terminally differentiated tissue. Uh, both of these enzymes are typically highly expressed in, like I said, rapidly proliferating cancer cells, also in embryonic development with a big downregulation with differentiation, and also under some nutrient-deprived conditions. And the role of these pathways in, in muscle and in differentiated tissue is very much largely unexplored. So this was quite an interesting finding. And the implications of that to, to the mechanisms of how anabolic agents work, um, we think it's quite new. So we are now performing some follow-up work, um, continued analysis. What I've shown you is a, a subset of um, more global changes, and we are looking for common transcriptional regulators that might be coordinating this response, and also conducting functional work to see what role do these enzymes have, uh, both in cells and also in vitro, and what is their implications in the regulation of muscle mass. And that's it. I'd just like to thank my 
uh, supervisors, John Bramwell and Tim Parr, and everyone that contributed to the work and the sponsors. So thank you for listening. Thank you.